morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Wallace. I'm the Chief Executive of Conservative Home. And it's my really great pleasure to welcome you all in person here at magnificent RSA House in London and many of you I know uh, watching around the country and indeed overseas uh, live online to the Conservative Home Future Jobs Conference. Now, while there's so many things roiling and raging away around Westminster and Whitehall around uh, and, and, and around the world beyond. It's very easy, I think, when people talk purely about the drama and personalities of politics to get swept up and forget the really core functions and the core effective elements of politics combined with the state, not least the positive differences that productive policy, government and Whitehall working together can make to people's lives. And when the next election comes, whenever that may be, Boris Johnson, who knows what, what data we're floating around people's minds, when people step out of their front doors to go and vote, one of the things I think will be utmost in their minds is the question of jobs. Is my job safe? Is it better in terms of its conditions, its opportunities, its pay, rewards, and the future prospects of, of, of my industry than it was before? Are there more choices or fewer choices available to me personally? Do my children have the chances or even more chances than I have? Are they going to leave school better or worse prepared for a world which seems to be changing faster and faster? And that's one reason why we decided to hold the Future Jobs Conference, to explore some of these issues about the changing nature of work, the changing location of work, the changing nature of the economy and the role that work can play within it. Um, we're very fortunate to, uh, and very grateful to have the support of Amazon, um, I know we're, we're joined by some, some of their colleagues today in making this event possible. Um, and also by the hard work of our events colleagues and our editorial team uh, on conservativehome.com. Um, there's going to be a huge amount to explore today. We've got a great lineup uh, for you. And so without further ado from me, I hope you'll join me giving a round, warm, uh, wel welcoming uh, round of applause to our first session, which is a live recording of the hit podcast, Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thank you very much, Mark, for that warm introduction. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the guest today, which is Justine Greening, who many of you will know was the Member of Parliament for Putney between 2005 and 2019, and served in the Cabinet in some of the uh, big spending departments such as transport, international development, as well as education. Uh, she left Parliament in 2019 to perhaps spend more time on policy and more time <laughs> levelling up. Um, Justine, you founded the Purpose Coalition. Can you tell us about what that involves? Sure. It's, it's bringing together lots of different business leaders, university leaders, public sector leaders to work collectively on driving levelling up. And it came out of a campaign that I launched as I left Cabinet called the Social Mobility Pledge, which was really saying to businesses in particular, um, look, even if we close all the gaps in the education system, if you're not open to that wider talent pool that Britain has, um, then we're not going to drive equality of opportunity. And so for us at the DfE, you know, we'd been talking about levelling up and it was very much um, an articulation of how you would achieve equality of opportunity. In other words, you don't achieve it by taking opportunities away from people who've already got it. It's really uh, a question of how do you extend it to people who don't and how do you put them in a position to be able to get those opportunities and take them. So the Purpose Coalition was really this group of leaders who got on board with the Social Mobility Pledge and then were, were, were saying, right, what's next? Yeah. And so there was a huge amount of appetite, I think, to do more and to campaign and to have more impact on the ground. And, and that's what we've been doing ever since. And what do you think we can, what, what have you learned from the experience of putting more of these um, groups together? Because it was one of the things that I realised in working in government and also having spent a bit of time studying at, at Stanford University in the States, is that there is a much bigger revolving door in the States between government, academia and, and business. And there are plenty of criticisms around that at various points. Um, but it's not something we have here. It tends to be much more kind of siloed. And on your podcast, Fit for Purpose, you've had many kind of university vice chancellors 
uh, come on the show and, and talk about what they're trying to do around enterprise. So what have you learned about bringing those groups together? So I guess, first of all, in terms of that relationship between politics and business in particular. So the challenge for business is it is becoming more like politics because actually businesses can't just say they're not part of a wider world and they need to understand what that wider world's priorities are and then be really clear about what they're doing to be part of the solution. We really saw that during COVID. You've seen companies now, as a matter of course, be clear about what their sustainability strategies is. My point to them and the case I'm making is that actually it's not just planet, it's also people. And that this country, as others, actually faces two big challenges. One is net zero, but the other is levelling up and persistent inequality of opportunity. And we need to tackle that. But fundamentally, and I spent 15 years in business and industry before I was an MP, opportunities really are about the private sector and business above all. So if you want to deliver a levelled up Britain, you've got to engage businesses. And actually, the really good news is there's a huge amount of innovation out there on the ground on levelling up, whether it's, we can talk a lot about what Amazon are doing, whether it's working in the community, so Amazon's got its huge Amazon in the community programme doing all sorts of different things, whether it is talent pipelines, and again, um, I hope John will briefly mention the work that they do with Bernardo's, which is actively, literally taking um, young people who are the furthest away from being able to get opportunities and then working with them to put them in a position where they can actually come in and get a career in what is a fantastic company with really very many different opportunities. Whether it's um, a co-op, working with a supply chain, whether it's you know even the BBC stepping up to the plate and saying, right, we are going to set ourselves some targets on people from lower socioeconomic diversity backgrounds, not just getting in but getting on. Um, all these different organisations saying, what does it mean to me? And in terms of our contribution to levelling up, what does that look like? And then the challenge, of course, for government is almost government's becoming more like business because government is about delivery. And so you can kind of see the two coming together. But I think really, if, if you look at this you know, ESG agenda that business has got and then the levelling up and net zero agenda that government's got, they are sort of the same thing, which is good, because it means we're all on the same page. And how can a business be more socially mobile with what it's trying to do? Because like you say, it's, it's one of the great things, getting a job allows people to kind of get on in life. And mm -hmm. business leaders may think, well, you know, I've created sort of, you know, however many X thousand jobs, surely that's, that's enough. Um, but what more can they do to really sort of ram home the social mobility aspect? There's, there's tons, and you've got to bear in mind that the current cost of living crisis we are facing is actually a social mobility crisis, yes. because it is all the same families who are on the front line and really struggling, who are, because of where they start, trapped in those circumstances. You know, there, there is basically no such thing as a, as a lower paid job. There's actually just an employer who hasn't worked out how that lower paid job goes on to the next rung up the ladder and becomes a career and so a lot of this is about employers choosing to behave differently and I think what I've loved about doing all the work through the social mobility pledge and the purpose coalition is you know businesses and employers don't really need a law change this is about how businesses understand that being open to that wider talent pool is good business for them and actually is part of almost what's expected in modern Britain so what you're seeing are companies really thinking about how they can work upstream, engaging with um, the education sector, a lot more work co-creating education, particularly with universities, particularly in places, parts of the country maybe where there's more of a levelling up challenge. Um, you're seeing companies start to look at how they, as I said, can influence their supply chain, but there's just, they can do measurement that alone is an important thing for, for businesses to do, to see whether their opportunities are actually tending or not to go to people who are from those backgrounds where we know above all now it is vital that we break that cycle. Are those people actually then able to progress or are there parts of the organisation and levels where they don't seem to get beyond? There's some kind of barrier, whatever that is. Um, and we're seeing really clearly now, I think, how you help people do those key transitions. Mm. 
in terms of what they need at the individual level to be able to progress on their, their path and achieve their potential. So if you think about Michael Gove's levelling up white paper, which I thought was a, a real step forward, that set out almost a macro picture for what we need to do collectively across Britain. But underneath that is almost a micro levelling up strategy that needs to be in place. And a lot of the, the organisations who will actually deliver that for people are going to be employers, not just in the private sector, um, but also in the public sector. So there's this huge opportunity. So you can see someone like Direct Line doing hybrid and virtual job recruitment, specifically in a social mobility cold spot, say like Carlisle. They need a lot of people. They're likely to work from home. You might as well have them in the same place, though, because A, they can meet one another. B, it's easier to do training. That's a simple but actually really powerful idea that can make a difference. Um, you've got UK Power Networks looking at how they tilt their apprenticeship program to do more pro-social mobility recruitment. A lot of them are thinking, well, actually, what do we need to do before that to create a pipeline that's broad? Um, and so some of them are looking at place-based um, approaches. Others are looking at people-based, like how do we bring on more neurodiverse people? What are we doing around carers? As I said, what are we doing around, um, you know, lone parents? And so they're all just biting off different chunks of the um, of the jigsaw puzzle and levelling up and succeeding. Um, when it comes to the language around, I think the the phrase you use there, cost of living crisis, is also a social mobility problem. is incredibly important and, and succinct for why the cost of living crisis is not just a short term problem, but could be something that has long-term uh, scarring effects on, on the economy and on the country more broadly. But language like social mobility, I think, sometimes doesn't necessarily kind of cut through to, to people. It's, it's a bit of a, of a kind of nebulous saying and, and so on. So what more can government do? It's a bit like the language around skills and, and skill sets. People often don't think of themselves as a kind of skill set. So how can the government kind of communicate? Because we all need to do lifelong learning. You know, um, Nadim has kind of, Nadim Zawahi is speaking later this morning, but is saying that if you've got people that you're trying to educate now that are still going to be working in 2060, 2070, we cannot possibly know the skills that are going to be used by them. Yeah, so you can't really do this, you know, kind of Soviet style, more tractors, please, because yeah. actually you don't know what the tractor is that you're going to need. <laughs> so it is a challenge for the education system. Um, and I think going back to that micro piece of you know so what do people need to you know what are the jigsaw pieces they need to be able to move you know one is around having the right attitude and understanding of opportunity if you don't even know about an opportunity it is impossible to go for it um it is having the right knowledge and skills and that is where the dfe comes in but it but i think it's part of it and i think that skill set that people need isn't just kind of core knowledge and skills. It's around a curiosity for taking risks, understanding how to learn about taking risks. It is about, as we all know, working in teams. And, and I remember a, a few years ago when we started the Social Mobility Pledge talking to the managing director of one of our major accounting firms, I'm not going to say which, but they had done a piece of work <coughs> and they wanted to know what do our most successful performers have? Because if we can find out that, then we should just recruit those sorts of people with it, whatever it is. And actually, they could do that because, as I know, I trained at PwC. After every client job, you, you have an appraisal. So actually, right the way through the organization, they've actually got quite a lot of good data about performance. So they, they go right the way through, and they, they talk to all of the top performers, and they have three things in common. <laughs> The three, there's nothing, and this is, there's no correlation on academics. That's the first thing to say. The, the things they had in common were they had all had adversity, actually, earlier on in their lives and, and had to somehow get over that. They had all had a Saturday job, paper round, something like that. They had all been part of a team that had achieved things. In other words... Perhaps unsurprisingly, what they'd found was that successful people are able to get over problems. And actually, the kinds of people who do that might be ones who've generally had to deal with more in yeah. their lives. 
they were people who showed a keen sense of effort and reward being linked, um, and they were people who could work in a team. The question I think back for education then is, if, if that's actually what successful people need, how can we make sure our education system is actually helping people develop those mindsets, those skills, alongside that core knowledge and skills yeah. that they'll need? So you're almost saying we don't know exactly what those roles will be of the future, but we do know that in a 21st century where it's all about knowledge and talent, that those early years in education and those attitudes that we're putting in into our young people are going to be crucial for them being able to surf and create that world and create the jobs that they're going to have in that world. And it'll, you know, you're going to hear from Amazon later. You know, who would have thought where Amazon would be now, even before the pandemic? Um, so it is hard to kind of exactly plan ahead, but we do know what the constituent parts of a successful Amazon will be, and I've been to some of their fulfillment centres, and it's not just what people know, what they're doing, it's the ability to switch around that company to get early leadership in actually quite small teams and hone your skill. It's all sorts of very practical stuff combined with a culture that is just really positive about getting stuff done that a lot of people really like because it doesn't feel bureaucratic and people can just run towards problems, get them fixed, and they are going places. Yes, there's the, uh, the famous story, and I don't know whether it's famous now, it's just become folklore of Jeff Bezos not allowing meetings to have that can't be fed by more than two pizzas, uh, <laughs> which is one of his, his rules, but it's very believable uh, even, if it's, uh, even if it's not true. What, so what's your advice to somebody in, that's, that's kind of under 25 perhaps and is trying to find their way in their career? Because I do think that young adulthood particularly is more confusing than sometimes we sort of give credit for and we kind of think people should have all the answers at 18 or post-university and, and actually it's, it's nowhere near that. What, what's your advice to those that are under kind of 25 that are beginning to make the steps in their career in terms of building some of those resilient skills that you mentioned? Well, I think first of all... Um, you know, it is a very unique um, environment people are looking at jobs in. I mean, certainly in the past it's been... So the good news is in the past it was a buyer's market and so employers would have a whole range of people apply for them and then they'd be like, who do I think is best? That has all changed. Yeah. It is now a seller's market and it probably will be for a while. And so that means, and, and what we're working with employers on doing is, so employers really need to be able to say to a whole new generation of people entering the workplace, why would you come to us? And that means having some sense of purpose in your job, in a, a business that's also got a sense of purpose about why what any of it does matters. It is about having a flexibility around the fact that people do want to balance and it's not just more hours for the sake of it now. Mm. People want to work smartly. They also want to see, where's my career going? So almost, that's quite a broad ask, but in a, in a, in a way it's also shifting away from, I'll just go to the highest bidder. Yeah. So it's just a very different, perhaps more values driven um, group of people entering the workforce and my advice to them would be don't worry if you don't know really what you want to do try different things most people don't actually yeah. have that preordained career or really have a clear sense I, I certainly didn't um, but that's okay and so it, it's almost a sense of be curious get those very different experiences realize that often some of the toughest times in your life are going to be the times when you learn the most and so if you can learn to take that rough with the smooth, actually, those are the times that you, you can really build. And so not to be too bothered about things when they go wrong, to kind of see them in the round as some moments when actually, possibly, that's the beginning of you be becoming a lot better than you were yeah. before. Even though it doesn't feel like it. At the Even time. though it doesn't necessarily feel like it. And in your career, you were kind of in, in PwC, uh, which has a kind of one of the challenges that I think for employers at the moment trying to hire young people is it has been that one of the big things is we'll map out a career plan for you and, <laughs> and so on. And actually, young people don't particularly want that. They want lots of different experiences and will only 
perhaps go and work in a place for two or three years, perhaps. Um, you went and did an executive MBA at mm. London Business School. What was your kind of thought process behind doing that? Um, and what did you learn from that? So it's a good example of where I was at a really good employer. So the kind of backstory to that was I'd said after I finished at, at PwC and I'd gone into industry and I'd passed my exams and I literally said to you know my mum, if I ever say I want to do any more exams, just shoot me um, <laughs> because because this has been hard. But anyway, sure enough, you know, a few years down the line, I'm like, oh, I feel like I need to learn <laughs> more things. I've got some experience. I now want to learn and and sort of broaden out almost from being, as it were, a finance person. Um, and so I started shooting off all sorts of emails in the company that I worked for, which was then Smith Klein Beecham, later to become GSK. And I actually got into a bit of trouble <laughs> because I was emailing these senior vice presidents of, of various areas that I thought would be quite interesting to find out about in a slightly uncontrolled way. But actually, um, after my boss, who was really nice, but a bit perturbed to find out that I'd been emailing lots of people, um, after he got over being a little annoyed with me, he came back to me and said, look, Justine, what have you, let's work out what's, what's next. Like, have you ever thought about doing an MBA? And I, I had, but I hadn't really come back to that thought. So, so they ended up sponsoring me to do an MBA at the London Business School. And um, it was just such a good example of how actually you took a moment where I, maybe I hadn't been at my best because I'd never had a mentor and didn't really know how to go. I was trying to work out, for me, as someone who was, as it were, from Rotherham and didn't really have that social circle, I was trying to create these contacts to find out what to do. Yeah. Whereas maybe for other people from other backgrounds, they'd have been able to have those conversations with their parents' friends, and that just wasn't the case for me. Um, but we managed to turn it into a really, a really great moment where I ended up doing an MBA, which also nearly killed me. Um, <laughs> so I was like back there again. <laughs> I do think there's something interesting about emailing lots of people at the moment. I think one of the challenges of working from home is it does mean that the, there used to be it used to be quite hard to apply for a job when you were in a job because you know you'd be at a computer all day. <laughs> Whereas now you can sit at home and your boss isn't quite looking over your shoulder, seeing you on the various job pages and, and so forth. Um, and so you know, impressive kind of city career, executive MBA uh, from London Business School, and then you decide, well, I'm going to do politics. How did that happen? Where did it all go wrong? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, well, I mean, I didn't really plan to do politics at all. I, so I, I, I thought I'd do a bit of leafleting yeah. with the Conservative Party um, because it was quite a tough time, and I thought, look, I know what my politics are, and I think it's quite important for people to still have a sense that their uh, choices, even if it's not a choice they want, eventually they'll want something different. At the same time, um, as a favour, <laughs> to be honest, I ended up running for council in Epping, and, and I got elected, <laughs> so I was like, oh God, I'm really busy at work, um, career's going pretty good, I was doing the MBA <laughs> as well, <laughs> so all of a sudden... So were I, you a paper candidate then? Sort of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to be... To be fair, I wanted to show that there were younger conservatives, um, and there were people who were, you know, under seventy, you know, in in the mix. Yeah. But anyway, I loved it, and so I, I kind of just really enjoyed getting stuff done, you know, back in back in Epping and. Yeah. I just really enjoyed it, and I'd never thought seriously about going into politics or standing for, for parliament and so my first decision was just I will stand for parliament it will be a really good thing to do for to be part of a democracy because I think that's good and I'd always watched people on the stage on general election night thinking what's that like yeah. you know when you have your name read out and everything mine's really short because I'm I don't have a middle name so I'm just Justine Greening so I had none of those embarrassing name problems to get over <laughs> that some people do so the initial decision for me, Jimmy, was just, I am going to try and be a positive, good part of our democracy. I want to be, want to be a candidate where they're like, oh, she was good. I don't really like the Conservatives, but I quite liked her. What shall I do? And for me, I thought, that's choice. So 
I did that. I really enjoyed doing that. And, and in the end, yeah, I'd moved to Putney and I was the Putney candidate and got elected. And you went on to kind of serve in, in Cabinet and do some of the really big jobs there as well. Which job did you most enjoy out of transport, education and mm. international development? Oh, I mean, I loved education, obviously. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, I went through the state system, went to my local comprehensive. I mean, it completely transformed my prospects. And the chance to be able to be in a role where I could make the system better for a new generation of people. And I'd go to these primary schools, and they'd be a lot like mine in Herringthorpe, infant and junior school, and, and, you know, secondary schools that were like Oakwood. And, you know, the thing is, you walk into those classrooms, and you don't know who those people are going to become. You know, they're little people. They're teeny tiny. They're in sandpits. They're doing silly things. But they could end up being like somebody who's running Amazon UK, they could end up being the most amazing tech entrepreneur that creates thousands of jobs that does the next iPhone. And the thing about human capital is it's unlike any other resource in our planet. Every other resource, the more you use it, the more it gets depleted. But with people, it's the opposite. The more you use them, the more you give them experiences, the more it builds them up and the, the stronger and better they become, actually. And so for me, education was really by far my, my favorite job. I think the role that transformed me on a personal level the most was doing development, mm. where I got to see some very different lives, some very different countries. Yet you could also see some parallels with our own challenges and, and this thread almost that connected up us. And you could see, if you're me, that's when I first started talking about something like levelling up and social mobility was in DFID. You could see this thing coming down the track for Britain where people will do anything for opportunity. It's the most precious commodity in the world. And that holds true wherever they are in the world. So you see people literally putting their lives on the line to try to get to somewhere where they can have some opportunity because we all want to have lives where we feel we've got a chance of making something of ourselves. And that's as true for, you know, kids growing up in, you know, the shacks in Nairobi as it is for me growing up in Rotherham. And so you could see that commonality, but you could also see how, for me, levelling up is then an international agenda as well as a domestic one. But hey, let's start with Britain first. Yeah. <laughs> and well, we're coming to questions in a moment, so if people want to get their thinking caps on and so on, we'll have a few minutes for those. The, um, the decision to kind of leave Cabinet, and you know, we talk about jobs and the, and the different jobs mm -hmm. that you've, you've done in Cabinet, um, the sort of the backstory to this is that the, the Prime Minister wanted to move you at the, at the time uh, to work in pensions, and, and actually mm. you said... I don't want to do that. And unlike a lot of politicians, <laughs> no. and know. unlike a lot of politicians, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you really meant it, and you stuck by your guns, mm. and you and you left it. You left cabinet kind of completely. And that must. What was the feeling after that decision? So I guess one of the lessons is always have a game plan. Um, you don't want to be making big decisions like that on the hoof. Um, but I did have a game plan, and. For me, this issue of weak social mobility, this problem of levelling up or the challenge, has been coming down the track for Britain for a long, 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 long time. And so I felt whether it was where I grew up in Rotherham, where I'd be back seeing family and just thinking, this place hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, or whether it was representing Putney, going out on some of my local estates. Um, as Jonathan at the back will know, I a sense of people right here in London, young people, locked out of opportunity. They're not getting on the housing ladder. Um, they happen to have been born here. Well, it completely chunks down. There, there's opportunity on the doorstep, but there are kids growing up in Greenwich. They're not going to work in the city. They don't know the right people to mm. network them in there. So you could see it coming down the track. And we had done work at the DfE to launch what we called a social mobility action plan, I did not want to really do a white paper that was going to take ages to get through Parliament. I felt we needed to crack on with this. 
and we didn't really need loads of laws changed to drive better social mobility. We just needed a game plan. So we did the social mobility action plan, and in that forward it says, the problem with Britain is talent spread evenly, but opportunity is not. Yeah. And so I just thought, look, I've done the talent spread evenly, but not developed co it consistently bit. I'm going to go off and do... If I can't stay and deliver that, then I need to go off and do the other part, which is opportunity not spread evenly, which is the social mobility pledge. Um, and I remember tweeting out saying, I'm going to work on social mobility, that's why I'm leaving. And I actually meant it. Um, and I had two objectives. One was to do the pledge, and the second was to put levelling up at the top of the agenda in Parliament, because I could not, for the life of me, understand why inequality of opportunity wasn't something we were all really exercised about. So, so that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and Jimmy, when I, I remember launching the Social Mobility Action Plan in 2017, saying, if we're going to change Britain, it's going to take sheer bloody mindedness. <laughs> and I sort of thought, I did mean that. And so, yeah, I thought, I'm, I'm working on this. Yeah. Whatever. So I took that ballsy decision to do that. To leave. And I just and thought, look, come on. You know, I'd had three amazing jobs in cabinet. You know, it was and and, and left on good terms. It was mm. it was great to be offered another one, but actually, I think you want to be doing stuff that you're really a hundred percent on if you're me. And I just thought it was really time for me to find out how far I could take leveling up, driving leveling up, social mobility, all of that stuff. If I really, I thought, what if I actually do loads on this? Where do we go? And, and do you think you're having, in the two and a half years since you left Parliament as well, more impact on that? Yeah, I do. Um, I felt that, in a weird way, the very thing that I'd got involved in, which was politics and, and, you know, and a political party, to help drive change, I, my sense was it, you know, almost the politics are getting in the way of building a consensus on driving levelling up and that the reality is that for long-term challenges like climate change, like levelling up, you do need to have enough of a common ground platform to really push things forward. And so I was just willing to step outside the system to see if I could play a role in doing that. And that's partly what the Purpose Coalition has also been about, just giving some different space, I think, for parliamentarians to come together on something that actually really is something they all genuinely agree on and I'm interested you know I think all the parties need to have some answers on leveling up I'd say it's the new NHS you're not going to win an election unless you have a compelling leveling up agenda whoever you are um, and that's good political competition and that's good innovation across the parties and I, I think we should Hope to see more of that. Great. So, questions. Have, there is a roving mic, I believe. Is there? Let's take these two here. This gentleman first, and then this lady here. Uh, my name is Richard Diamond. Uh, very interesting, and, and agree with everything you've said. Can I ask you where you think two other groups fit in this? You, you, you've talked about. See, Amazon is one of our sponsors today. You've talked about your experience working with very big organisations at mm -hmm. PwC mm -hmm. uh, and GSK. Uh, the vast majority of people, of course, work and are likely to work for the foreseeable future mm. in very small businesses mm. uh, and where you see the role of the SME sector. And the other one, declare a vested interest as, as an elected member of a London borough, uh, where do you see local authorities fitting mm. into this? Great question. So... So you're right, we have to crack SMEs and levelling up, for sure. And we're doing a piece of work on that right now to look at what's some of the innovation you can do to, to make sure that SMEs are at the centre of all of this. Some of the supply chain work starts to get you in that space of seeing where that might fit in. Some of the other ideas are around um, clusters of SMEs where actually they're in an ecosystem often and actually can they kind of work a bit more collectively together um, if you crack SMEs I think it completely transforms our ability to drive levelling up as you say and then as for local councils yeah they're, they're really 
almost going to play the most pivotal role in some respects. Um, and when I was at the DfE, we did this approach called Opportunity Areas that was place-based education. Um, and the reason we did that, and I did that, was because actually very different communities have very different challenges. And so the levelling up communities, challenges we face here in London, are going to be very different to, to those in rural Lincolnshire. And that's not a problem. It just means that you need to have a version of a levelling up strategy that can flex to some very different places. And, and local councils really are that transacted to be able to, to, to tailor and galvanise at that local level across these very different parts of a community that all need to come together and pull in the same direction. So I'm very pleased that Michael Gove's at um, the Department for Leveling Up Communities because actually, you know, he has got the sort of ability that you need to be able to see and navigate through how that actually works on the ground. I think the key point for me with local government is that we've, we've got to realise this is a national agenda and it's every bit as relevant for parts of London and the South East and South West as it is for, say, where I grew up in Rotherham, although no one has to tell me, you know, I guess I was a Red Bull Tory before it became really fashionable <laughs> <laughs> with William Hague. Um, but yeah, I completely, completely get um, the focus as well. Um, in other parts of the country, it's badly needed. Um, so no, local government rocks when it comes to levelling up. It is literally the key to success in a way. Hi there, Radhika. Great discussion, both. Um, Sorry, what's, what's your name? Radhika. Radhika. Um, uh, what's next for the Purpose Co Coalition? And is there anything further that organisations you work with within the coalition could be doing more of? So I think I think we've always just tried to steadily build the the building blocks in the sense for how you drive social mobility. So the first one of those was chunking down leveling up into its constituent parts so that it just became a bit easier for people to navigate and that was something we did back in early 2000 early 2021. Um, we launched this framework called the Leveling Up Goals, which was basically inspired by, for me, all the stuff I've been involved with in development, doing the Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. at the UN, because um, I see weak social mobility as a development challenge for our country. Um, so the Leveling Up Goals almost was this framework that whether you're Amazon, whether you're the BBC, whether you're a small company, you could look at and say, where do we fit in? Is it the goals in education? Is it the goals on access to opportunity and progression? Is it the goals on digital divide or communities, etc., health? Um, we could then start to set about measuring that. I think there's a lot of work to do, but um, we've been partnering with the ONS on their work. Um, so measurement becomes a big thing for us. We've got a lot of our Purpose Coalition organisations doing um, socioeconomic diversity measurement for the first time. You know, if they don't actually track whether their opportunities are breaking that cycle, then it's hard to know whether you're making an impact and they need to make an impact. So I think we'll, we'll do more on that. And then finally for us, I think we're at the stage where there's a very big what works agenda that I think we've already got into quite a lot, but I think we can probably do much, much more as more organisations come on board and there's more innovation and you can start pulling together those threads. Um, and I think for Britain, a massive opportunity, isn't it? Um, if we can get on top of how we free up our talent um, in communities around the country, wherever they are, um, if we can have our employers really being more open than any other country to that wider talent pool, not, uh, not just able to recruit it, but to be places where that real diversity can thrive, because we know that drives results. Um, that's actually how you're going to succeed in the 21st century. It's all going to be around whether, whether countries have been able to unlock the potential of their, their most important resource, which is, which is their people. So it's a really exciting agenda, I think.
And what a fabulous note to finish on. I just wanted to ask one more thing before. One of the differences with politics now is that there are many more ways to get involved with it through various mayoralties and so on. And we've seen the likes of the impact that Ben Houchin and Andy Street have had in their various uh, parts of the country. Is that something that might appeal to you a few years down the line? Sorry, what's that? What? Would you, like running for a mayoralty role, would that be something that kind of appeals? <laughs> Oh, I don't. I, I, I'm really happy with what what I'm doing and the change it's driving, and I think there's a lot further to go on all of that, to be honest. Um, I hope that there's a practitioner piece of it, that people who are leaders at a local level, at all local levels actually, can really pick up and run with. Um, so I don't know. If you'd asked me what I was doing three years ago in the three years <laughs> time, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this. I have no idea, Jimmy. What I do know is... Ever the politicians aren't seeing Well, no, so. but what, <laughs> what I do know is it'll be about how I drive levelling up across this country. That is it, and that's what I'm focused on. Brilliant. Justine, thank you so much for coming on Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Home. It's been great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a huge thank you to Jimmy McLaughlin and Justin Greening for that fascinating first session. Now, we have a couple of minutes comfort break. Get yourselves a drink of water, nips the loo, etc. Um, and then we'll be... And also rate the Jimmy's Jobs of the Future podcast available at all good podcast outlets and uh, probably some other ones as well. Um, and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes in person here at RSA House, live online on the Concert of Home YouTube channel for our panel on the future of the Workers' Party. Thank you.